The story you're about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts about historical characters, events, or locations. Please sit back and listen as I narrate this story to you. There was no doubt that Al Capone ruled the cities and the world during Prohibition. However, in 1931, the fearsome mobster was imprisoned for tax evasion. Though he was eventually released, his health had deteriorated to the point where he was unfit to lead the Chicago outfit. And for a while, it was unclear who would be the best man for the job. Tony Accardo enters the picture. Though Accardo began as one of Al Capone's low-level associates, he gradually rose through the Chicago Mafia ranks. Before becoming captain of his own street crew, he worked as Capone's chauffeur and bodyguard. He would eventually take over the entire outfit. Accardo ruled the Chicago Mafia from the shadows rather than the spotlight for over 40 years. During that time, he used his position to expand the criminal organization's operations and territories giving it more power and wealth than it had seen in years. Accardo never achieved the same level of celebrity as Al Capone. Even today, not nearly as many people are familiar with Accardo's name. Many experts, however, believe that this is one of the main reasons for his success and a testament to his intelligence. The future kingpin was born Antonino Leonardo Accardo on April 28, 1906 in Chicago's Little Sicily neighborhood. His father worked as a shoemaker and his mother was a housewife. He was the second child in a family of six. By 1920, when Tony was 14 years old, it was clear that he had no desire to succeed in school. He dropped out of school quickly and worked as a flower delivery boy and a grocery clerk. Accardo joined a gang of local hoodlums after dropping out of school as a young adolescent. This group, made up of thrill-seekers rather than professional criminals, would frequently rob stores and steal cars for fun. Accardo, on the other hand, was not afraid to use violence to get his way, which impressed the crew's more experienced misfits. Accardo was arrested several times for disorderly conduct in front of a local pool hall frequented by Al Capone. He had already met Al Capone by the mid-1920s. He was officially initiated into the Chicago outfit at the age of 20. He became a member of the Circus Cafe gang and committed numerous violent crimes for the organization. His circus gang pal, Vincencio de Mora, later became a hitman in Capone's crew. De Mora persuaded Capone to promote Accardo when he was looking for new bodyguards. Accardo allegedly tracked down three mobsters who had betrayed Capone early in his career and beat them to death with a baseball bat. Capone, apparently pleased with his work, gave him the moniker Joe Batters. Accardo later boasted over federal wiretaps that he was a participant in the infamous 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre in which Capone gunman allegedly murdered seven members of rival Bug Moran's Northside gang. Accardo also claimed to be one of the gunmen who assassinated Brooklyn gang boss Frankie Yale on Capone's orders to settle a dispute. Most experts believe Accardo had only tangential ties to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and not to the Yale murder, which was most likely committed by Gus Winkler, Fred Burke, and Luis Campagna. Accardo, on the other hand, may have taken part in the assassination of Northside gang leader Jaime Weiss near Chicago's Holy Name Cathedral on October 11, 1926. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre sent shockwaves throughout Chicago, prompting the government to tighten its grip on the city's organized crime and it wasn't the mob's only setback. Capone was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to prison in 1931. Then, in 1933, prohibition was repealed. With the legalization of alcohol distribution restored, the outfit needed to find a new source of revenue. Of course, the mob needed to find a new leader as well. Accardo was appointed capo or captain of his own street crew around the same time. While he was gradually becoming an important voice in the outfit, he wasn't ready to take over the entire operation just yet. For a time, Frank, the enforcer in Niti, took Capone's place as boss. After serving his own 18-month sentence for tax evasion, he became the new outfit boss. Accardo had established a solid track record of making money for the organization by this point, 
so Niti let him form his own crew. He was also named the outfit's chief enforcer. Accardo quickly established several lucrative swindles, including gambling, loan sharking, bookmaking, extortion, and the distribution of untaxed alcohol and cigarettes. Accardo, like all Capo regimes, received 5% of the crew's earnings as street tax. Accardo, in turn, paid a tax to the outfit's boss. A crew member would be killed if they refused to pay a street tax or paid less than half of the amount owed. Gus Gussie Alex and Joseph Joey Doves Ayupa, both feature outfit heavyweights, were among Accardo's crew. Accardo's position in the outfit grew stronger in the 1940s. As the decade progressed, senior members of the outfit were investigated and charged with extorting millions of dollars from Hollywood studios by using the threat of strike action by the labor unions they controlled. Niti committed suicide in 1943 because he was claustrophobic and feared serving a second prison term. Meanwhile, Paul the waiter Rika attempted to take over as boss, but Rika got into trouble with the law as well and was soon locked up. Accardo was fortunate in that he was a close confidant of Rika, who had named him as his underboss before going to prison. He was the day-to-day boss of the Chicago outfit by the mid-1940s. Accardo became acting boss after Rika was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in the Hollywood scandal. When Rika was barred from contact with mobsters as a condition of his parole three years later, Accardo took over as boss of the outfit. In practice, he shared power with Rika, who remained in the background as a senior consultant. Rika and Accardo ran the outfit for the next 30 years until Rika died in 1972. Accardo took advantage of his newfound power to steer the outfit toward gambling. The outfit expanded its operation to include slot and vending machines, counterfeit cigarette and liquor tax stamps, and narcotic smuggling. Accardo installed slot machines in gas stations, restaurants, and bars throughout the territory of the outfit. Outside of Chicago, the outfit expanded into Las Vegas, usurping control of the gaming industry from the five families of New York City. Accardo made certain that his slot machines were used in all of Las Vegas' legal casinos. He used the official prohibition on alcohol sales in Kansas and Oklahoma to introduce bootlegged alcohol. The outfit eventually dominated organized crime throughout most of the western United States. He phased out some traditional activities such as labor racketeering and extortion to reduce the outfit's exposure to legal prosecution. He also turned the outfit's brothel into a call-girl service. As a result of these changes, the outfit entered a golden era of profitability and influence. Accardo, who specialized in bookmaking, took control of the wire services that carried racing information. That way, he could assist bookmakers in setting odds and collecting on bets. He expanded the outfit into new areas of the city and beyond in addition to identifying new sources of income. The outfit was soon wealthier than it had been in years. Accardo's relatively modest lifestyle, on the other hand, would lead you to believe he was not a wealthy man. When asked what he did for a living, he said he was a beer salesman and a good one at that. He was also married to Clarice, with whom he had two daughters and two adopted sons. Unlike Al Capone, whose extravagant lifestyle drew the attention of law enforcement, Accardo preferred to operate in the shadows. Accardo's influence on organized crime was both enormous and invisible due to his discreet manner. It's no surprise that FBI agent William F. Romer Jr. referred to Accardo as the genuine godfather. Though Accardo officially retired as a mafia boss in the late 1950s, he continued to wield power as a consigliere. He stepped aside rather than stepping down from a position of power. Accardo began to enjoy the benefits of his job as he distanced himself from the outfit. He lavishly planned his daughter's wedding, took her on an extended vacation to Europe, and took up deep fishing as a hobby. Accardo's photo with a freshly caught 400-pound tuna fish earned him a new nickname in the press, Big Tuna. But like other mobsters, he was not immune to police suspicion. He was also not exempt from spending time in court. Despite multiple convictions for various crimes, Tony Accardo was only ever imprisoned for one day when he was detained for questioning in a gambling case. Accardo appeared to be on the verge of serving a prison sentence in the early 1960s 
Despite vowing not to repeat Capone's mistakes, he was found guilty of tax evasion. Accardo was indicted after the IRS investigated his bank accounts. He received a six-year prison sentence and a 15,000 fine. The conviction was later overturned due to a biased media coverage during the trial. He soon retired and was summoned to the Senate several times for mob-related investigations. He invoked the Fifth Amendment guarantee 172 times and denied any involvement in the Chicago mob. Accardo's problems, however, were far from over. It quickly became clear that the new outfit boss, Sam Giancana, had some issues. While Accardo advised Giancana to keep his head down, Giancana ignored his advice. Giancana, like Al Capone, craved attention and reveled in the spotlight. The outfit did not fare well under Giancana's leadership and he was eventually imprisoned in 1965. While he was released a year later, he quickly fled to Mexico to avoid further grand jury interrogation. Giancana, however, was unable to maintain a low profile even in Mexico. With his flashy persona as it was, he quickly drew the attention of the cops. Giancana was arrested by Mexican authorities and deported to the United States in 1974. He was later called as a witness before a grand jury, much to his chagrin. But he was never able to continue because he was murdered in 1975. While it was never confirmed that Accardo ordered the hit, many experts believed that no one else would have had the power to do so. Even as he grew older, he maintained that he was nothing more than a beer salesman. While authorities clearly knew he was up to no good and continued to investigate him in his later years, he was never charged. Tony Accardo died of congestive heart failure and acute respiratory failure on May 22, 1992. He was 86 years old, a remarkable feat for someone who had spent most of his life in such a hazardous occupation. Accardo's long life was attributed by the Chicago Crime Commission to his insistence that the Chicago mob avoid drug trafficking, which had a corrupting influence on many other criminal organizations. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took time out of your day to listen to my narration. This is Nikki of Twisted Mind and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Salamat.